In the last video, we learned about glycolysis, the splitting of glucose. We saw a little bit of ATP production, a net of 2 ATP from this process. But a glucose molecule can generate a lot more than that. If we think of ATP as being like an energy dollar bill, then glucose is like an energy $38 bill. So we're not done with that glucose molecule yet. At the end of glycolysis, our glucose molecule is now present as two 3-carbon pyruvate molecules. Let's continue on and see what happens to them. This slide shows the citric acid cycle. Actually, it shows something called pyruvate oxidation, or sometimes it's called the preparatory steps, as well as the citric acid cycle. But we'll just simplify and refer to everything on this slide right now as the citric acid cycle. This process starts with pyruvic acid, which is the same thing as pyruvate. Remember that glycolysis produced two pyruvate molecules. Each of those pyruvates can continue on to the citric acid cycle, though other things can happen to those pyruvates too. Let's follow the fate of one of those pyruvates. In the first step, pyruvate oxidation, a carbon-carbon bond is broken and the now single carbon is given off as the waste product, carbon dioxide. You couldn't see me, but I put air quotes quotes around waste product because the carbon dioxide can be used as part of the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffering system. Remember that from chapter 2? But here, in terms of energy metabolism, carbon dioxide is a waste product. Anytime a carbon-carbon bond is broken, that liberates high energy electrons that can be harvested and loaded onto more electron taxis, NADH. We saw that in glycolysis and we see it again here. We're also left with two, uh, the two carbon compound from the pyruvate that we started with. Those two carbons combine with a molecule called coenzyme A to form the intermediate acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is an important biological molecule. Lots of things can be made from that two carbon compound. You'll discuss, you'll discuss a little more of this if you take a nutrition class. For our purposes, we'll just continue to follow its breakdown, or its catabolism. In the next step, the coenzyme A portion is broken off. It's reusable in other metabolic reactions. And the two carbons, remember those were originally part of pyruvate, which itself was originally part of glucose, they enter the citric acid cycle. Here's a more detailed view of the citric acid cycle. It shows the two carbons from acetyl-CoA combining with a four carbon compound called oxaloacetate. I don't care that you know that name. To form the six carbon compound called citrate, otherwise known as citric acid, where the citric acid cycle gets its name from. From here, a series of enzyme catalyzed steps convert citrate back to oxaloacetate. I don't care that you know the details of this page, just the main results. What you might take away from this page is that the 6-carbon citrate molecule is quickly converted to a 5-carbon molecule. That means a carbon-carbon bond is broken. And like we saw in the oxidation of pyruvate, when a carbon-carbon bond is broken, energy is released, high-energy electrons are harvested and loaded onto electron taxis, more NADH, and the carbon atom is given off as the waste product, carbon dioxide. If you can see where all that is occurring in this complicated picture, that's great. Keep going and find where the 5-carbon compound is converted to a 4-carbon compound, and you'll see the same set of thing associated things. High-energy electrons are harvested and loaded onto more electron taxis, NADH, and the carbon is given off as carbon dioxide waste. If you can't make sense of all of that in this detailed picture, don't worry about it. Let's go back to the more simplified view in our text textbook and try to see what's going on. We start with one of the pyruvates that was produced in glycolysis. That pyruvate has a carbon-carbon bond broken to produce acetyl-CoA, and then two more carbon-carbon bonds are broken during the first half of the citric acid cycle. Each time a carbon-carbon bond is broken, a carbon atom is given off as waste carbon dioxide, and high-energy electrons are harvested and loaded onto NADH taxis. In the second half of the citric acid cycle, carbon-hydrogen bonds are broken, 
and the remaining energy of, from our original glucose molecule drives the production of one ATP and high energy electrons which are harvested and loaded onto FADH2, another type of electron taxi, and one more NADH. All of that is for one of the pyruvates produced in glycolysis. But the same thing can happen to the other pyruvate too. So all of the reactants and products in this reaction should be doubled to capture all of the activity that takes place as a result of our original glucose molecule. We'll sum up that productivity in a bit. Before we do that summarizing, let's note the cellular location. In prokaryotes, the citric acid cycle occurs in the cytoplasm, just like glycolysis does. In eukaryotes, the citric acid cycle occurs in the matrix of the mitochondrion. This means that the products of glycolysis, pyruvate and NADH, must be transported into the mitochondrion for the citric acid cycle, uh, that is, for the remainder of glucose catabolism. Well, what are the products of the citric acid cycle? Six carbon dioxides are produced. Since we started with six carbons in our, in our original glucose molecule, this means that by the time the citric acid cycle is over, we have gotten rid of as many carbon atoms as we started with. We also produce two ATPs. But as I said earlier, ATP is like a dollar bill and glucose is like a $38 bill. So far, we haven't gotten much for our investment. What we have obtained are bunches of high energy electrons. They're loaded up onto NADH and FADH2 taxis, and they're looking for something to do. We'll see what that next something is in the next video on the electron transport system.